So hello everyone, um, welcome to our talk. Welcome to the tutorial, uh, writing a cluster API provider. Um, we're just going to quickly introduce ourselves. I am Anusha, I am a technical product manager at Nirmata. I've recently shifted my focus to Kubernetes policy and governance, but prior to this, I extensively worked on cluster API and I'm also a maintainer of cluster API provider for bring your own host. Hi everyone. My name is Richard. I work as a principal engineer at SUSE. I'm currently one of the maintainers of the AWS and micro VM CAPI providers. And I have a particular interest in how you uh, represent managed Kubernetes in cluster API. I'm a Vishai Traeger from Red Hat. Among other things, I'm uh, one of the leads of deployment OpenShift on-prem. Um, Part of that using cluster API. Hi, um, this is Winnie Kwon. So I'm engineering manager at VMware, and I'm also a contributor to cluster API provider AWS and GCP, and also worked on managed Kubernetes in cluster API. Okay, okay then let's get started. Oh, sorry, the podium is here, the slides are there, and we're going to talk from here. Um, so, quick show of hands. How many here are familiar with Cluster API? What Cluster API is? Cool. Uh, have you all worked with a provider before? Yes? Yes, perfect. And how many here want to have an actual use case to write a provider from scratch? And how many are looking to you know, start contributing to existing providers or Cluster API? Okay, perfect. I think our tutorial is well catered to all of these. So today we'll be learning, we'll start with what is Cluster API, just the basics, so that you know all of us are on the same page. We will go a little bit into the Cluster API provider theory and then uh, jump right into writing a provider. Uh, so before that, we have a GitHub repo with all uh, the instructions present. So if you can scan the QR code or directly head over to Cappy Samples GitHub IO. So we have all the prerequisites listed there. Uh, feel free to you know, start uh, doing the prerequisites. It's just a bunch of tools that you'll have to install uh, while we go through the basics in parallel. Okay, uh, can we move on? All right, thanks. Uh, and also, so we have only about 90 minutes today. Uh, and I'm going to take up like 10, 15 minutes of those talking theory. So in case you need help during the tutorial, and also if there are any audience joining us virtually, I recommend you join our Slack channel in the CNCF Slack. It's called KubeCon NA 2022 CAPI Provider Tutorial. So you can either raise your hand here and one of us will come help you out. Or in case we cannot, please use the channel for all discussions. And not just during the session, if, you run, if we run out of time today and you're still determined to complete the tutorial, you can continue to use the Slack post the session as well. So I'm going to stay on this slide for about five seconds. All right, so let's get started. So what is Cluster API? So it is a solution for declaratively specifying a Kubernetes cluster, just like you would declaratively specify workloads that run on the cluster. So this pro project was built on the premise that cluster lifecycle management is difficult because historically there have been a number of ways and methods and tools to provision a Kubernetes clusters and uh, the user experience is not consistent amongst these tools. So what Cluster API aims at is providing a consistent user experience in the lifecycle management of clusters. So be it like create, upgrade, delete, the entire LCM part of it. Um, and also we have a CLI called Cluster CTL. So it handles the uh, lifecycle of the CAPI management cluster, which in turn does the lifecycle management of workload clusters. So you can use Cluster CTL for initializing your provider or upgrading your provider, et cetera. 
So there are community calls, that is weekly office hours on Wednesdays, and every provider has their separate office hours uh, in a separate cadence. All of these is available on the Kubernetes community calendar. And for a complete walkthrough of CAPI and understanding what CAPI is, the working of it, so there is a series on YouTube by Stefan and Fabrizio called Let's Talk About. Feel free to check it out. And also on Friday afternoon, there is a CAPI tutorial happening by the core CAPI team. So uh, that might be of interest to some of you all. Uh, so what is a cluster API provider? A provider is essentially a Kubernetes operator. Uh, it implements infrastructure or operating environment specific functionality that is used together with core CAPI to manage the lifecycle of a Kubernetes cluster. The provider will adhere to certain contracts that is defined by CAPI. CAPI specifies different kinds of contracts for different kinds of providers. So we will shortly look at what are the different types of providers, but there is a contract defined for each type of provider. The contract is implemented via the providers using the custom resource definitions, and the adherence to contract allows interaction between core CAPI and its providers. Um, so let's refresh our CAPI glossary. So the CAPI Cluster API book has pretty extensive documentation on various concepts, experimental features, and there are like lots of code snippets for examples. Um, but these are some of the high level things, like what is a management cluster? So it is a Kubernetes cluster that manages the life cycle of workload clusters. A management cluster is also where you would run your providers and custom resources like machine or machine sets would be stored. Workload cluster is where you run your workloads on. The control plane is a set of components that serve the Kubernetes API and continuously reconcile from a given state to a desired state. And machine is the declarative spec for an infrastructure component hosting a Kubernetes node. And machine deployment and machine set, now this is analogous to a deployment and a replica set. So this makes sure there are always the desired number of machines present in your cluster. And machine health check, as the name suggests, checks the health of your machine. Uh, if it is deemed unhealthy, it CAPI just rolls out a new machine for you. So we talked about different provider types. So there are currently three types of providers in CAPI. One is the infrastructure provider, and this is the most widely available. And as the name suggests, so this type of provider is used to provision any infrastructure that is used to create a Kubernetes cluster in a target environment. For example, Cluster API provider for AWS creates AWS resources like VPCs or EC2 instances. But the infrastructure provider itself doesn't uh, provision Kubernetes. And for that, you'll have to use a bootstrap provider. So bootstrap provider is something that provides with bootstrap scripts. Suppose say you're using Kubadium as your bootstrap provider. It will provide you with either Kubadium init or Kubadium join, depending on whether you want to initialize or join a cluster. These uh, scripts will be available in the form of secrets that your infrastructure provider will read and execute so that uh, you can bootstrap the cluster itself. And the third type of provider is the control plane provider. It is used to represent and manage the lifecycle of a Kubernetes control plane. Or if you're using a managed Kubernetes service like EKS or AKS, then uh, it will directly manage those services in AWS and Azure. Uh, quickly moving on. Sure. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry to interrupt. Maybe let's go back to the prerequisite slide to make sure everyone is. Okay, yeah. So for, I think for people who joined in late, um, we do have a we do have a documentation on GitHub, and I urge you all to go through the prerequisites and you know install a bunch of tools that are needed so that when we get to the tutorial section, we can jump right in. And I want to give a quick disclaimer. We just figured out today morning, I think Docker desktop version 413, we found some issues. So uh, anything up to 412 will work perfectly fine. There was some problem with the kind create cluster, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to jump back. So, yeah, let's, so let's quickly discuss the different custom resource types in CAPI. So CAPI has a number of custom resource types to logically difference part of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and all the gray boxes here represent the CAPI custom resources. Uh, 
So the, so the one on top, the cluster itself, so it's, it, lo it logically represents the cluster as a whole and contains general configuration information like the pod cider block or what is your Kubernetes uh, version itself of the cluster. Uh, we have these resource kinds that represent a way to manage machines. So we have machine, machine deployment, machine sets, and machine pool. A machine is equivalent to a single node, whereas a machine deployment and machine set make sure the number of replicas of your machine is always in the desired number of replicas that you want. Whereas machine pool is used uh, in terms of like auto scaling or virtual machine scale sets in Azure, you can dynamically scale up and scale down a machine pool. And then we have machine health check, like we described earlier, it checks the health of your machine. If any machine goes down and if it's deemed unreachable or unhealthy, then Cluster API uh, provisions new machines for you. Now if you're creating, so that was core CAPI cluster resources. Now if you're creating a bootstrap provider, uh, you'll be creating custom resources to represent bootstrap information. So it will need to contain configuration like QBDM init or join, depending on whether you want to initialize your cluster or join a node to an existing cluster. So in this diagram, all the pink boxes represent a bootstrap provider resource. So one thing to note here is all the pink boxes are encompassed inside the gray boxes. So it means either uh, the core CAPI resource own these uh, provider resources or they reference to these resources. Next, if you're writing an infrastructure provider, then you'll be creating a custom resource to represent the infrastructure you'll be creating in the target environment. So all the orange boxes here represent an infra provider resource. The infra cluster on top is, it, it represents the base infrastructure that is required for the cluster. So this uh, involves things like networking and security groups. But it doesn't uh, contain any information that is particular to the machine itself. For that, you have infra machine, infra machine template. These custom resources uh, have configuration information that is needed to actually bring up a compute instance. For example, an EC2 instance or a vSphere VM. And you can also see the examples of the naming convention that is being adopted by different providers. So you just prefix the resource kind with the provider name, like you have AWS cluster, Docker cluster. Similarly, you'll have an AWS machine or a Docker machine. By now you get the drift. Similarly, you'll have a control plane uh, provider resource, and all of these resources will either be owned by core CAPI resources or referenced by CAPI resources. So, uh, so, let, so what actually makes up a provider? So we discussed so far that CAPI defines certain contracts for different kinds of providers, and depending on the type of provider you want, you need to adhere to the contract. So all these, uh, uh, so you can adhere to the contract based on CRDs, and we also discussed that a provider is nothing but a Kubernetes operator. So it means it ha it'll have a bunch of controllers that will reconcile the CRDs that you've written. Then there will be additional Kates resources to deploy the controller itself. So these are a bunch of YAML files and things like RBAC configuration, and then metadata and repo layout. So this is not necessarily a CAPI contract, but it's sort of like a best practices that is followed, which makes your provider releases easier. And also like if you want to use cluster CTL to initialize your provider, uh, if it is in a certain repository layout, it will be easier for cluster CTL to discover your provider and initialize. All right, I think that was enough theory. Uh, over to Richard. Cool. So we've now could now uh, move on to the practical part of this. So this is the actual tutorial. So it's expected to be um, practical. So you do the work yourself um, and actually build your own provider. So what are, what are we actually going to be building? So we are going to be building a infrastructure provider uh, for Docker. So this is going to be loosely based on the existing Docker provider within CAPI, but it's going to be simplified and achievable within the time frame that we have uh, allotted to us. As, a, as Anusha mentions, as it's an infrastructure provider, our provider will have to provision any infrastructure that is required for the cluster. Now, in the case of this provider, it's going to provision container instances. So we will be 
uh, creating a container instance for a load balancer, and the load balancer is for the API server, and then we will be creating container instances for every machine or node within that cluster. So we will be interacting with the Docker API to, to spin these container instances up. We will be using the KubeADM control plane and bootstrap providers. So that those are the things that we'll be doing actual bootstrapping of Kubernetes within those containers for us, but we'll just be using those. So a bit about the tutorial format. So um, the idea is you will work through the various sections within the tutorial docs. I will put the link up again in a minute in case anyone hasn't got it. So you, the idea is you work through them uh, in order and it will slowly build up the provider for you. So we're going to allow a certain amount of time per, per section uh, for you to, to work on that but we will then move on to the next section just so that we can discuss each section as we go along. But the main thing is don't panic. You don't have to finish it uh, within that time. Just, just take your own time. Um, but we just, just for the sake of the tutorial, moving things along, we will move on to the next section. And the main thing is what, what we want to do is give you everything that is required or needed for you to go away and potentially build your own uh, cluster API provider. So if you, if you get stuck or if you just have any questions, uh, please just raise your hand uh, and one of us will come and help you. So as you go through this, there may be questions or there may be issues. So yeah, just make sure you raise your hand. Um, also, if you just want some extra context, also, just raise your hand and we, we can answer any questions you want. So hopefully you don't go away with any questions unanswered. But if you do, you know, you can always follow up with us on the Slack channel after this session uh, or, or grab us afterwards uh, or the rest of QCOM. So I'm just going to put the link up again uh, for those that have just uh, arrived. If you, if you scan that code, it'll take you to the tutorial documentation. Um, that's going to live there as well after this session. So, you know, you can go back to it and use it as reference. Also within that, um, so if you go to the, to, the, to the site and click through to, to GitHub, you'll also see a reference implementation that goes along with this as well. Um, but again, also just feel free to, to join Slack as well. So, there are a number of sections in there, so we are going to, well hopefully you've already started installing the prerequisites, then we're going to do some basic setup, um, and that's going to be dealing with the repositories, etc. Then we're going to do some scaffolding, so code generation, and then we're going to move on to uh, setting up Tilt. Now Tilt is essential to, it's an essential quality of life improvement for you, um, otherwise it's, it can be quite a painful iterative process without that. Then we're going to move on to the, to the meat of uh, writing the, the provider. And this is the thing that starts to differentiate it from a normal operator. So we're going to implement the Docker cluster or the infrastructure cluster as Cappy sometimes as calls it. Then we'll move on to the, the Docker machine representation and its controllers. And then we will talk about uh, well, webhooks. After we've done all of that, then we can actually create a cluster with our provider. And hopefully, we'll all get to that point so that you can then apply a YAML to your management cluster and see your new provider create a Kubernetes cluster for you, which will be great. And then right at the end, we are going to cover some stuff around uh, releases. So if you want your provider to be installable via cluster cuttle or cluster CTL, then there's certain things that you must do as a provider implementer uh, around GitHub and, and certain files, and we will cover that as well if we have time. Oh, so I'm going to just switch the slides off and then we will... So give me two seconds. So. Hopefully everyone can see 
that screen right? Um, please raise your hands if you can't see it, if you need it, anything bigger. And also, again, just a reminder, just to raise hands if you have any questions. So we won't be executing every single command from those tutorial documents. So for some sections, we will just to highlight some, some key points. But the rest of the sections, we will we'll give you an overview when we get to that, um, with the expectation that you will run through those instructions from the site. So. So when you go to the site, um, the short tutorial site, if you just click on Start Tutorial, and then you'll see the various sections uh, on the left-hand side. So just a note about the prerequisites. Is everyone, has everyone installed the prerequisites yet, or is, are people still doing that? Anyone need more time? No, no one's raising their hand, so. Oh, you need more time? Oh, you're done, cool. That's even better, um, great. So the first thing is, is the setup. So in the setup, we are essentially going to have to do two things. First of all, ideally, fork the cluster API repo or clone it down to your, to your local machine. Um, you can do either or. The thing to note here is when you are cloning it, clone it into your go path. Um, it seems a bit antiquated now to clone things actually into the go path. But this, these are for historic reasons. So some of the tool, co-generation tooling doesn't work outside of the go path and you, it ends up embedding it in crazy locations. So it's much easier if you actually clone these into your go path. So if you can do that with the, the cluster API repo, and then after you've done that, you will need to create a new repo in GitHub under your own username called cluster hyphen API hyphen provider hyphen docker. Now the name there is follows conventions. Um, probably don't need to uh, explain the conventions. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory, but pretty much all providers are named the same. And there are some slight variations. And then, then at the bottom, we just add some uh, git ignores. Um, feel free to, to do those or not. It's, it's up to you. Um, so I'll probably give people a couple of minutes to do that. And if anyone has any questions in the meantime. No. So I'm going to do the same as well. Um, so create Yeah, I can do that. Is that better? Yeah. Yep, yeah, cool. So I've already created the repo in, in GitHub, so I'm just going to clone it down to my machine. So I generally have two windows open at a time, or two terminal windows, um, or, or panes, depending on if you're using uh, Tmux. So the first one is in the directory of, of my, the provider I'm working on, and the second one was, is in the directory of Cappy itself. Does anyone need more time with the, this first part? And when you go through these, these instructions, sometimes you will see reference to within GitHub to CAPI hyphen samples. Uh, in most instances of that, you will be, especially on commands, you'll be replacing those with your username. So in case there's any that have been missed within these, these documents, just to know. Cool. So now that we have the repos set up and cloned down to our local machine, we can actually move on to, to scaffolding. And the purpose of this section is to essentially scaffold the project or, you know, or to generate all of the code that is required as a basis uh, for you to then build your controller. It takes a lot of the, the 
pain out of doing all that initial code because QBuilder will generate that for you. Now, this, these steps are essentially applicable to any operator that you build using uh, QBuilder. So you can take this away and build whatever operator you, you want. So I am going to do these steps. But essentially what we're going to do is we're going to use QBuilder to initialize a project. And then we are going to use QBuilder to add APIs and controllers for our Docker cluster and Docker machine to that project. And at that point, it's going to generate a whole bunch of code for us and, and YAML that we can then use without having to write it ourselves. So if So the first thing we're going to do is initialize the project. So we're going to use the cube builder in it here. So there's a couple of things to note is the domain. So most providers create their CRD definitions within an API group that ends with this uh, cluster.xcates.io. The other thing to mention here is obviously in the dash dash repo, put your repo in here that you have just created. So what this will do is it will essentially generate the, uh, some code for us and then tell us, oh, well, now we've created a project, you should probably add an API to it. So that's what we're going to do next. I'll just pause for a minute. So the next thing we are going to do is we're going to add a new API definition or CRD. Um, so this is going to be for our Docker cluster. As you can see at the end here, this is in the kind. Another thing to note is we are using a group here. So this is a prefix to that domain that we just used. And the convention is that the group is prefixed with the type of provider you are building. So in our, in, in our case, we're building an infrastructure provider. So we're going to prefix the API version, Kubernetes API version with infrastructure. You also see, just to overload the terms, um, we are specifying an actual API version in, in the sense of Kubernetes and CRDs of, of V1 Alpha 1. Um, you can choose whatever you want here, um, but just be aware that depending on your level of the API, there are certain API guarantees you should adhere to. So Alpha APIs are the most lenient to change. So I'm going to execute that. It's going to ask you, should I create the resource? So should I create the, the custom resource definition? So, yep. And should I then create a controller for that? So there are situations when you run this where you won't want to create a controller. And this is specifically for things like templates. So you will have later on something called a machine template. And as the name suggests, that's a template that ultimately results in an actual machine. So you don't need a controller to be generated for a, a template resource. But in this instance, we are creating a, a, the cluster infrastructure resource or Docker cluster. So we do want a controller. So I'm just going to say yes. It's going to then generate a whole bunch of stuff for me, code and YAML. So then what I generally do then is, oh, let's, let's just wait. So then we've done, we need to do this basically the same, but for the machine. So we are going to have essentially two API definitions, Docker cluster, and Docker machine. So one to represent the cluster as a whole, the infrastructure, and one to represent individual machines. And that's exactly the same command, obviously just changing the name. So I'm going to execute that now. I want to create the CRD and the controller. So as part of the code generation or the, the initial init, it's going to create a make file for you. And then there's a bunch of targets in there that you'll need to use as you develop your, your provider. So the first one is um, make generate. So what make generate does, as, as the name suggests, is 
it's going to run a bunch of code generation tools against your API definitions. So it specifically for things like generating deep copy functions. So it allows you to create copies of your, your uh, API types. But it will also run things like uh, default generations. So if you want to have supplied default values of some sort that don't necessarily fit into the queue builder defaults definitions. So if you want to do something a bit more complex with your defaults, you can also create something called defaulters. Uh, and then there is a code generation tool that would be run from make generate as well to do that. So I'm just going to run that now. And we'll soon have a look at what this is all done. So the next make target that you need to be aware of is make manifests. So as the name suggests, this is actually going to create the Kubernetes manifest um, from your definition, from your code mainly. Um, so what you'll see is when we start to look at the code, there's going to be a whole bunch of cube builder special comments throughout the code. And this make manifest will run some tooling that understands, scans the source code, looks for these, these comments, and it generates Kubernetes artifacts as a result. So as you make changes to your API definitions and your controllers, make sure that you are running make generate and make manifests to do that code generation. So now we've got our code, we've got our manifest. Um, we should probably just check that it actually compiles because it might not do. So there is a build target. Okay. How's everyone getting on with that so far? Any problems? No. Oh, okay. No problem. No problem. Cool. Okay. Yeah, so I'll give you a few minutes just to, to get to this point because this is the, the starting point for the rest of the sections. So I will also, for anyone that's just joined, I will also just show the link. So if you just joined, feel free to um, scan this and go to the tutorial docs. So we are just in the setup section and the scaffolding. Uh, yeah. Yeah, if anybody has questions, you can raise them. We can, we can comment. And also, if anyone missed it, um, there is a Slack channel in the CNCF Slack that you can join. You can ask questions there now or after this session and we will try and answer them as well. Mm-hmm. 
does actually make target controller Zen? I'll probably give people another minute or so, and then I'll carry on. So let's do this. So either actually uh, create the controller Zen. Then if you run, what, what are we running? Make generate. Yeah. So if you do that, it it is oh. Cool. Okay. So now we're going to have a look at what the, these commands have generated for us. So I'm just going to use VS Code. Um, I probably need to change the size of that, do I? Hopefully that's better. So there's a couple of things to note from the, from the generator. So this has all been generated by those kubebuilder commands. So I'm going to just start at the top and, and work my way down just to give you an, an idea of what it's generated. So the first part that it's generated is our API definitions or our CRDs. So these are in the API folder. So we ran two kubebuilder commands, one to create the Docker cluster API and one to create the Docker machine API. So it has generated two API definitions for us. So I'm not going to go into too much details. But if you go in there, you'll see that there are definitions for Docker cluster, its spec and its status. These will be covered a bit more later on. And the same has been done for Docker machine. So in, if you also remember the make generate command, so that has generated the anything with zz underscore, that is auto generated by that make generate command and, it, and the underlying code generation tools. So if you see see those, you don't need to do any modifications to any files with zz underscore. As well as creating the API definitions, we said yes to creating the controllers. So these live in the controllers folder. And again, there is one for each of the APIs that we created. So one controller for Docker machine and for cluster. Again, I'm not going to go into too much details here, but you can see. Yeah, can you it's very hard to see. Is it? Yeah, but the color is not very hard. Yeah, the schedule. Yeah, I don't know what to do about that. Can you find the schedule? Look, the link is in there. Can you or see the screen where? It's already difficult to see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where is it? That's the one. Yeah. Is it because it's hazy or? It's okay, yeah. Uh, I think the contrast is a little bit hard to see, but yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, so it has generated controllers for us. It's scaffolded. So I mentioned earlier about the kubebuilder comments. So you can see some examples here. And this is where you can add kubebuilder comments to your code. And specifically here around RBAC, and when you do the make manifest, it goes through the code and it sees comments like this and it generates um, RBAC uh, definitions for us. And there's various other forms of these, these uh, comments throughout the code. So that moves on to the config section. So this is where kubebuilder has spat out a whole bunch of Kubernetes YAML for our provider. Uh, we will be making changes to this. And some of this is influenced by these comments in the code. That's probably pretty much um, I'm going to walk through on this, you know, the, the code. Um, but, you know, there's usual other stuff. One thing also to note is the project file here, and this is a kubebuilder thing where it records everything that is created for you, just so you know. Right. So there is one small change that we want to do at this stage from the auto-generated code. 
is to change the port number of the health endpoint. So it has generated it with a port number of 8081. Um, we just need to change that to 9440. So what you'll need to do is go to the main, find the health pro bind address, and you'll see it is 8081. Just change that to 9440 and save. And this is mainly because we are simplifying the artifacts and deleting some of the um, artifacts that are used by Customize, where it's using a different uh, port number. So that's pretty much the scaffolding. So we've scaffolded the code, we've got the, the, you know, the bare bones for our API and our controllers, so now we can move on. So before we actually get to implementing the controllers and the API definitions, uh, we want to cover something called Tilt. So has anyone used Tilt? Nice, good. Yeah, it's a real quality of life uh, improvement. Um, before Tilt, it was just so painful to, to run your, your controllers and, and to debug them. Um, and the, the CAPI contributors have really put a lot of work into their tilt file and it has a lot of features within it and it is really really helpful so to give an example and then we'll be going through this you have the option to start your controllers via delve and then so you can just set a connect and set a breakpoint and debug your controller within the cluster so for your provider to be usable via the upstream CAPI tilt file, you need to tell that tilt file about your provider. And this is done via a file in the root of your repo called uh, tilt-provider. And this just gives various information to, to the CAPI tilt file about your provider. So I, we're gonna create this file now, so I'm going to have to So I'm just going to clone the repo so we don't have to create all of the files on here. Yeah, so if you want to do that as well, um, it's up to you, or you can carry on going through the instructions and building it yourself. So we were just on the tilt. So in the instructions, you're going to create a tilt provider file um, in the root of your repo. So it's going to look like this. So hopefully you can see that. So the few things you need to be aware of in this, in this file. Number one is the name. So this is the name that you're going to use with cluster cuttle later on when you say you want to install this provider into your cluster. So choose a name that represents your provider. The next is the image. So this is important. The image you specify here, you have to also use that within your manifest definitions for your controller, so within the deployment. If they don't match when you run tilt, it's not going to replace the image with your locally built one. And so you, you're going to have issues. And then it's the live reloads. Uh, section. So you can specify folders and files that you want Tilt to watch. And if there's any changes to those files, Tilt will essentially recompile your uh, provider and redeploy it into your cluster. So you, you can get into this iterative development cycle. So for, on every change, it builds and redeploys for you. In the instructions, there are some various other um, tasks around just making changes to the, the 
Kubernetes manifests. So you will need to do those. But essentially, if you do all of that, you get to the point where you can create a kind cluster. You're going to have to use a specific kind configuration here. And this is because you need to pass in the Docker socket from your host machine into kind so that it can then be used uh, via your provider. So if we go to the instructions, So it's going to ask you to do a whole bunch of stuff with the manifests. And then it's going to ask you to create a tilt settings file in the cluster API folder. Now this is the thing that when you run tilt and it interprets the cabby tilt file, it knows to locate your provider. So you'll see at the top, um, a reference to your provider, so the repo. So you'll see in here it's a relative um, location. So you need to make sure that, that is right. So that, that's what will tell Tilt to, to load your provider along with the Tilt provider set, uh, file that you've just created. And there's a few other things you can do within the settings. So if you want to enable uh, experimental features in your provider or within CAPI, you can set the environment variables here to enable those features. Likewise, you can override the arguments for your controller. So a common usage of this is to increase the login level. So you get trace messages uh, as opposed to just informational messages like normal. And then the really like, magical part from, from implementing your provider is the debug section down the bottom here. If you, have a, if you had to add this debug section and you add it for your provider, so you, You'll see in this, um, in this instance the um, debug and then the docker hyphen kubecon section in there that's specific to my provider. And what, I'm, what it's basically saying is when you run my provider in, in, uh, in the cluster, start my provider via Delve and make it listen on the port specified here. So you can then just use VS Code, create a launch configuration, and set a breakpoint and attach to your provider and start debugging it. So after you've done that, it's going to, like I said, you're going to have to use a specific configuration file when you're creating your kind cluster. Now your kind cluster is going to act as your management cluster in this instance, and this is just to pass in the Docker socket, like I said. So I'm going to do that now. So that will run. maybe start sometime soon. Once it's done that, you can do tilt up. And if you press it, ooh, that's not a good start. So that's what will happen if you put in the wrong path. It will fail to start with until and you'll get a big red message. So if I change that to copy sample, so I'm going to use the reference implementation. It should be a lot happier now when I start it. So this will take some time. And um, what you'll see in a minute is on the left hand side, as it enables and installs the compiles and installs the providers. Um, you'll see it, them appear on the left-hand side into various groups. So it groups them by provider type, um, but also by you know binaries and controllers as a whole. So whilst it's doing that, so whilst it's starting up, so because we added the debug section. 
if you wanted to, um, you could actually then create a, if you're using VS Code or something else, you can do the same in GoLand or on the command line. If you create a launch configuration for Go, say connect to server, and then you'd have to give it to the same port as you put into the tilt settings file, which I think was 31,000. So at that point, you sh should be able to set a breakpoint within your controllers if you wanted to, for example. There we go. And then start the debugger and it will hit the breakpoint. I'm not gonna do that now because we will cover that later on. So you can see now that all of the providers have started on the left-hand side. And you should see our Docker provider there as well. So if you do all this, this is what will happen for you. Um, yeah, and if you change any of the files, it will then reload it for you. So I think we're done with that section. So now you can get to the real implementation, which Avishay will do. Do people need more time to uh, run, the, run your test? Hi. No, everyone's good? Testing? Okay. You need time? Yeah, yeah, let's, let's give five minutes because it, it takes a lot of things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we need to give people time, yeah. yeah because like one person was like trying to create kind of cluster, it was like taking forever. We all need some more time, or can we proceed? <clears throat> okay, give it a couple more minutes. Keep going. Okay. So we're going to work on the Docker cluster uh, resource now. I'll go through it with you in the tutorial. I recommend you not to copy and paste all the lines of code right now. Uh, you can kind of look along in the Cappy samples repo. But I think it'll be more valuable for you to kind of understand what we're doing rather than typing it all out right now. Um, so basically, when we're implementing Docker cluster, 
what makes it different than any other controller, any other API, is that we have to adhere to the specification, to the contract that we have with Cluster API itself. So you can see here a bit of uh, overview. We can see that it's telling us that we must have a spec with control plane endpoint in it. And we must have a status with ready as a Boolean. And it also has some optional fields that we can add. Um, this is part of the what's called the cluster API book, highly recommended reference. Um, it has some more details in here if you go along on your own time, including a flow chart of what a typical controller would do. Um, for our example, as Richard and Anusha mentioned, we're going to be implementing machines as Docker containers. So each machine that we bring up will be a Docker container, both for control plane and for workers. And because we have, we're going to have three control plane nodes, right, for implemented as Docker containers, we need a load balancer to sit in front of them and direct the API traffic to those three control plane nodes. So that's the main work that our uh, Docker cluster controller is going to do. So the first thing we're going to do is define the Docker cluster API. So as part of the scaffolding that you did in step three, we got you know, just some empty kind of file, not empty, but you know, just the basics. There's a, in the spec, there's a foo string in there. You can delete that. And we're going to put in the control plane endpoint that the specification requires of us. And in the status, we're going to put in the ready. Ready is something that CAPI itself is going to look at, and once it's true, it knows that all the infrastructure is ready and it can proceed. In addition, in the spec, we have uh, the load balancer image, which you can, uh, users can use to optionally override. And we have a finalizer. Uh, for those of you not familiar, a finalizer if it's placed on a resource, it means that the resource won't be deleted as long as that finalizer is there. So if a user goes and tries to delete the, the Docker cluster, uh, Kubernetes won't allow it. And the controller that we're going to implement now will see that that Docker cluster is being deleted It'll clean up the infrastructure, mainly the load balancer, and then the controller will remove the finalizer once everything is cleaned up, and then Kubernetes can go ahead and delete the Docker cluster. So if you did that yourself, or if you're using the example, you would run now make generate, make manifests, and that would update all of the generated scaffolding that we did at the beginning to reflect those changes. And now we'll look at the controller itself. That's in the file uh, controllers Docker cluster controller. And the reconcile method. So for those of you who are new to controllers, Basically, Kubernetes will call this reconcile method every time something changes, okay? What is that something? By default, it'll be only Docker cluster. I'll skip down a bit. So if you look at the setup with manager function, this defines exactly when the reconcile function will be called. So it's going to be called for Docker cluster. And for your own uh, controllers, you'll see it with the 
Docker machine cluster in a bit. You can also watch other, other resources. And you have to make sure that your reconcile function is going to be called whenever it needs to be, okay? If you're missing something, if you're not watching the proper resources, Kubernetes won't know to call your reconcile function and then things won't happen. Okay, so we're going to implement, so we're going to create the Docker cluster reconciler struct, uh, initialize the logger, initialize the context, imports, and let's get to the real work. So the first thing we do, we got, our reconcile function got called. We don't know for what yet. So the first thing we need to do is to fetch the Docker cluster instance that was modified, right? So our reconcile is going to be called whenever Docker cluster is modified or at some other points, for example, if we returned an error, then we'll get called again at a later point in time to try again. Uh, if we return, for example, requeue, we told Kubernetes to requeue us, then we'll get called. But it's generally called when a Docker cluster uh, instance is modified. So we fetch that Docker cluster. Next, we get the Cappy cluster that owns this Docker cluster. So there's a utility that makes that easy for us based on the owner reference. Now, if we got an error, so this is all part of the controller convention. We got an error, we return the error, and that will requeue and call the reconcile function again at a later time. And if the cluster is nil, we'd, it wasn't set yet, so we just return and we'll try again later. Um, we might have an annotation is paused. Um, that can, so if, for example, cluster CTL move will pause the cluster, so we're just not going to do anything right now because it's paused, so we return. And now, finally, after all that initialization stuff, we can do what we set out to do, which is create a load balancer. So we create this, we create the load balancer uh, object. We create a patch helper because as you're all familiar with, every time a controller does something, it should update the status of the resource. So this patch helper is going to do that for us. And we have a defer. So anytime we return from now on, we're going to patch the resource, which means updating it in etcd. And now we basically kind of have a fork in the logic. So if we're detecting that the uh, Docker cluster instance was deleted, we do that by checking if the timestamp is not zero, then we're going to call a function called reconcile delete. And if it was not deleted, we'll call a function called reconcile normal. Okay, so we define those two functions. And let's look at what reconcile normal does. So again, we set up the logging. Um, the first thing we do, if we check if the Docker cluster instance already has the finalizer that we talked about earlier. If not, we add it. And then we return with requeue true, so we add the finalizer and then we come back to, and our reconcile function will be called again. Uh, an important thing to note here, our reconcile function, it's always taking a look at the spec, taking a look at the real world and making the real world match the spec and then uh, 
displaying in the status the status of that real world, right? So it has to be ad impotent. Any time, don't assume that you know your reconcile function got cold earlier. Don't assume that it wasn't cold earlier. You really have to check and make sure that it's totally ad impotent. So that's why we're going to now create the actual load balancer and get the IP from IP of that. So LBIP, we'll have the IP of the load balancer. And then we put that IP and the port into the spec.control plane endpoint. Finally, once we do that, we set status.ready and we can return. Remember, we had that defer function uh, in, uh, earlier, so it'll patch the Docker cluster instance and we're good to go. The next thing we do for delete, I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but we're going to delete the load balancer, right? So we got the Docker cluster instance was deleted. We delete the instance and we remove the finalizer so that the instance will actually be deleted. And that's pretty much it for this. Um, oh, I'm sorry, one thing I missed earlier about the setup with manager. So we're watching the Docker cluster, but we're also watching Cappy cluster. And not all of the Cappy clusters, if you look, it, it's, it's watching only the Cappy clusters who have a kind we're pointing to Docker clusters. It's important to, when you're watching, to kind of filter out as much as you can. For example, if you're watching, if you need to watch secrets for secrets changing, don't watch all the secrets in, in your entire system. It's going to take forever. So maybe watch in a specific namespace or by label or something like that. And again, once you finish all that, make build, uh, make manifest, make build, so that everything you just did will take effect. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is the machine, Docker machine. I'll hopefully go through this a bit quicker. Um, the API has a provider ID that's according to the contract. That's a unique ID, which will be a reference to this machine. It has the, the, the ready Boolean, just like the cluster did. And it has addresses, which will contain the IP addresses for this machine. And just like the cluster, we have a machine finalizer. And after you finish defining your API, make generate, make manifest as usual. Okay, so what are we doing here? Um, users aren't creating machines directly. When you create uh, your cluster definition, you typically will create a machine deployment, which is similar to deployment that you might be familiar with with pods, which among other things has a count of how many machines should exist. And it has a Docker machine template which will tell Cluster API how to create each individual Docker machine. Docker machine. Okay, so what does the reconcile here look like? The first thing it'll check is if cluster, so, excuse me. First, we're going to do all the, you know, getting the machine, getting the cluster, and so on. I'm not going to go into that here in this step. You can see it in the, in the GitHub of the Cappy sample. So assume we already got the Docker machine, we got the Docker cluster, we got the Cappy machine, we got the Cappy cluster. We got all of that, and now we're going to check. 
if the status of the cluster if cluster status infrastructure ready is false, we don't have anything to do at this point. We're waiting for that infrastructure to come up. If the machine already has a provider ID, that means we have no work left to do. We probably just, uh, we're missing the status, dot ready, so we set it and return. Okay, now we wanna do the actual work. To do that, we need uh, bootstrap, okay? If, if we don't have the bootstrap data, we're going to return. The bootstrap data is basically what will turn that simple Docker container into a Kubernetes node, okay? So it has all of the instructions to do that, uh, either in cloud init or ignition format. And if you're doing it with a cloud provider, then the cloud provider will typically execute the uh, cloud init or ignition for you. Here, because we're Docker, we don't have that luxury. We're going to actually execute it ourselves in the code. Okay, so we check external machines exist. If, if the external machine, meaning the Docker container that we wanna create now doesn't exist yet, we create it. And now that we created the Docker container, we're checking if it's a control plane machine and we haven't yet configured the load balancer for this machine, then we update the configuration of the load balancer so that it'll point to this Docker container that we just created. And if we did that, then we set status.loadbalancer configured to true and we can move on. Now we check if the machine was, if the Docker machine has been bootstrapped already. If not, then we do what I mentioned. We're going to get the bootstrap data. That's with a helper function and then exec bootstrap. And that's basically just gonna execute all those commands one by one in the Docker container. You can see the get bootstrap data function here. Now we get the IP address of the Docker container and set it, um, set it in the status. Okay, the next, this next thing that we need to do is a bit uh, of an implementation detail, but it's important. We're setting the provider ID. Okay, the provider ID is what I mentioned. It's a unique identifier for this machine. We're setting it on the Docker machine. It'll be copied to the Cappy machine. And it, has, and it will be set on the node in the cluster that we're creating. And it, we have to make sure that the provider ID on the machine and the node match. Um, it's important for things like auto scaling so that Cappy can see, okay, I'm now deleting this machine that corresponds to this node. It's used uh, for CSR, certificate signing request approval. Um, so we're doing that manually here. We get the provider ID, we're setting it on the, we're, we're setting it on the node here, and we're setting it in the spec.provider ID. Okay, so at the end of this, we have the node and the Docker machine having the provider ID set. We can skip these details for now. We set status.ready to true, and then the defer statement will patch the Docker machine instance. For delete, it's very similar to the delete of the Docker cluster. So we delete the Docker container. We update the load balancer configuration if it's a control plane to no longer point to this container. We remove the finalizer, and we're done. Um, 
The setup with Manager here is very similar to that of the Docker cluster, not going to go into it right now. And the last thing is the Docker machine template. I'm also not going to go into details right now because of time constraints. You can see it in the CAPI samples, but basically it's just a new CRD that's pointing to the spec of the Docker machine. And that way, uh, CAPI knows how to create uh, Docker machines when it needs to. For cloud providers, it might have things like, you know, amount of CPU cores, amount of RAM, things like that, things that you want each of your specific machine to have those properties. Winnie? Okay. I need to change the computer. So, are you sure? You have 15 minutes. Yeah, well, I don't know how to create cursor on that. Okay. Do you want to go and we'll switch it? But I have demo okay. here. Write a cloud infrastructure provider. <laughs> uh, so, uh, in the CAPI samples repo, we already have a cluster API provider for uh, Docker uh, uploaded. So, if you all want, if you're like feel like you're not able to catch up within the next few minutes, feel free to like browse through the code, and Vinny will run through a demo, so it'll be easier to follow along. And also, uh, the tutorial is live, and the Slack channel will be active for a few more days after the session. Thank so you. feel free to ask us questions mm -hmm. over there. Um, yeah, so I think the idea is to help you get started to writing a provider and also maybe you know uh, get your contributions to Cluster API and its providers. You know, uh, you can get started with all of those. So yeah. Okay, uh, so we actually have a material on webhooks and also like releasing, but we have like only 13 minutes. So <laughs> I will not go through the adding webhook section, but uh, basically the like queue builder take care of all the logistics about creating webhook server and like providing the uh, certificate and everything. So just like follow this uh, along uh, when, when you have time after this, this one. So I will actually just go to a uh, create cluster section. So now we built, uh, we, we set, we created API, we um, set, we actually wrote the controllers, and we now wanna actually create cluster. So every provider usually uh, supply template. So if you look at our provider, we actually already ma made the uh, 0.1.0 release. Um, and you can see actually cluster template we uh, provide as a provider. Um, and this section actually has a section how to create the default template and all this. But I will, I will actually not go through this. And instead what I will do is that, um, just hold on. So, so basically, if you uh, follow through our instruction, um, there will be a template directory that has a cluster template. So this has a uh, definition of a cluster, Docker cluster, Docker machine, kubeadm control plane, like everything you need to create cluster. So you have this in, um, so that's what we are explaining here. And we actually, um, so there is an instruction to generate the template. So as you can see here, we actually have some like variable, what we call token here. And this, uh, when you, when you uh, generate the template, you can actually set them as an environment variable. And when you use cluster cuddle, generate cluster uh, from this template, it will actually replace uh, to those variable with our environment variable. So, um, so this is how you generate the template. And I actually already 
created the template. Uh, uh, just hold on. So, um, uh, so I already have a template generated. So what I will do is uh, on the left side, I will actually run this watch, uh, watch cluster cutter, describe cluster uh, command. So it will watch. So we don't have cluster yet. And on the right side, I will actually also um, watch Docker PS because we are creating uh, Docker containers. So let me do this. So if I apply this template, so it actually generates a bunch of YAMLs. And you can see that uh, this cluster cutter describe. It is actually showing the status of uh, our cluster generation. As you can see, it's like changing. Uh, it's actually scaling up, bootstrapping, and it's, it, it's actually showing the latest, the latest status of the cluster creation. And if you see the right here, you actually see that this container is uh, the load ba balancer container uh, Abhishek explained. And the next one, we have a control plane uh, coming up, and this is our worker node coming up. So it's almost done. Uh, and I was actually giving uh, some command here you can, you can use. So you, you can watch your cluster status here, but if you want to like, know a little bit more about different things, what you can do is uh, you can actually get cluster. So, so you, you see that, oh, it's provision. And you can actually see our Docker cluster. And you can get a uh, Docker machine. And you, can, you see the uh, control plane and uh, like worker, worker node. And, and if you want to know like, more about this, like, oh, what's actually happening, uh, then you can actually get the YAML about this uh, Docker machine. And we actually have a conditions for uh, this Docker machine. So you can see that a container is provisioned, bootstrap uh, execution succeeded. And uh, combining this, uh, there is like ready condition showing that this Docker machine is like ready. Uh, so, yeah, so um, that's actually what's happening. Uh, yeah, so it's done. So, so this uh, machine deployment is forced because uh, we didn't, we didn't uh, apply CNI yet. Uh, but once you apply CNI, it will actually become ready. So I will not go through that. Uh, but basically, our cluster is ready, except that it doesn't have CNI yet. And it, it shows all the Docker PS and everything. And, and, and just uh, for your information, uh, if you want to like, know what's really going on, you actually can uh, look at the logs of our controller. So for our Docker controller, you can actually, I, I like, normally follow. Uh, and, or like, if you have a tilt, you can actually look at from tilt to UI. So it, it, it's, it's actually showing like all the steps done, done with the, our uh, provider, what, what it's doing. It's like reconcile request receipt. It's like waiting for bootstrap provider controller to set the bootstrap data. So if you have some issue, you can actually look at the logs of this controller and see what's happening. So yeah, so we have five minutes, so like, <laughs> come, come on. Um, yeah, so that's actually all I had, but um, there are like more instructions in, in this tutorial. So please take a look at it, and we actually have a release section that, uh, that explains how to release a provider using GitHub Actions with all the examples. So yeah, take a look at it, and <laughs> yeah, let us know. Has anyone got any questions? <laughs> yeah.